Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I can't tell you just how proud I feel right now. I'm just, I'm just so proud of these guys. Um, this morning, uh, if you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, and me and Angel kind of had a contest on who was going to get to say that first. And Jessica beat us both to it. <laughs> so if you would, open your Bibles to 1 Peter, 1st chapter, 1st verse. <coughs> As you all know, this 1 Peter was written by Peter the Apostle, most likely with a little help, because he was a somewhat uneducated man, but he got a little help from, from, uh, from somebody else. But he, he inspired it, and he got it written, okay? 1 Peter, 1st verse, 1 through 9. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, strangers in the world scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bethania, who have been chosen according to the knowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ sprinkled by his blood. Grace and peace be to yours in abundance. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power unto the coming of the salvation that is re ready to be revealed in the last time. And this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of our faith, the salvation of our souls. Now, I want to go back and emphasize where our sermon is going today. And it's going to emphasize in verse 6. And this you will greatly, re greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Now, how on earth does Peter expect us as humans and as Christians to have joy and to capture joy when the whole world's falling around us? around us. You know, when we got, instead of having one flat tire, we got three flat tires and the other one's got a big hole in it. You know, when everything is messing up, everything's just, just going to pieces, you know, how do we capture joy in those circumstances? Now, when Peter wrote this, it was a time when Christians were starting to be uh, persecuted greatly. In fact, not long after this, when Rome burned, Nero started crucifying Christians. They were greatly persecuted. And not long after that, Peter himself was crucified. But in all of those trials, he could find joy. You know, when we're facing a really bad illness, or a loss of a child, or loss of a career, or loss of a job, or wondering how we're going to pay the bill, you know, when we're facing things that just seem more than, more than we can handle, what really are the promises that God's giving us, that Peter is writing about? And that's what we want to present to you this morning, is how do we capture joy in the midst of terrible trials and tribulations? And I'm going to turn it over to these two guys, and they're going to give you the word. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is Angel, and today I'm going to be talking about how to capture joy in tough times. The first insight to capture joy in tough times is that God reminds me I am only passing through. Peter writes to encourage you and me. He tells us that we are only passing through, and this world is not our home. 1 Peter verse, chapter 1, verse 1 says, To God's chosen people who are temporary residents in the world. When I was in fifth grade, I was diagnosed with a heart and brain condition called neurocardiogenic syncope. It causes the blood to not pump to my heart and brain correctly. I was about 9 or 10 years old when this happened. At that age, it was very hard for me to understand. I was really scared. I was having up to 20 seizures a day, passing out, hitting the floor, back to back to back. 
From my memory, I think the scariest part was waking up from a seizure and not having vision. I lost my vision temporarily. And it came back, and I knew that was because of him, because he was in my life. And today, I still don't know what's going to happen in the future, but I do know that I'm going to walk each day with him by my side, and he's going to make everything okay. I realized that I was just passing through a tough time in my life. This life as we know it will not last forever. We in this world will pass, and there is going to be a time when you and I, as followers of Jesus, will be coming home, because we are not home yet. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16 tells us exactly what kind of home we are waiting for. They are looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. God has prepared a city heavenly for them. One day you and I both will be living in a wonderful, perfect, inimaginable place that he has created for us. But the final homecoming that we are going to face will outweigh any earthly benefit we will ever receive on earth. A paraphrase of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19 states, If all we get out of Christ is a little inspiration for a few short years, we're a pretty sorry lot. Jesus wasn't just a good teacher that gave us some inspiration on how to live our lives. He came to give us everlasting life forever. He came to bring us home, and when life gets tough, you and I need to remember that no matter how hard our struggle is, or how hard our troubles that we are going through is, we're just passing through, and we're walking with him by our side. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody this morning? It's a beautiful day outside. I walked outside. I was like, thought to myself, Sunday lunch at Grandma's was going to have to be eating outside today. <laughs> but um, um, the second insight to capture joy through tough times is that God reassures me with living hope. So imagine a neighborhood, a beaten, I mean, a beaten down neighborhood. Everybody brought it up. The community's going good. Everything's going good. So the state decides that they want to tear up the neighborhood and run a highway through there after everything's been fixed. They have a year notice. Everybody has a year notice to move out. Um, so things that break sidewalks that crack would be left. Cracks in sidewalks would be left. Nothing would be fixed. Playgrounds would be ne neglected. All stores in the neighborhood would be gone by the, by the time the year's up. Well, long before the bulldozers came, the neighborhood would look shabby or even, you could say, abandoned. Peter says in chapter 1, verse 3, God has given us new birth into a living hope through the Resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We all have these wishful plans that we hope will happen. Things that we wish we could do today, tomorrow, next week, or even next month. We have, so say you're going on a vacation. You really look forward to that. And you might say you look forward to that more than anything. Hope's a big thing, and you hope that happens. But... The biggest hope that we have is hope through Jesus Christ. The living hope that you have because of the believer is based on not, not by wishful plans. The hope Peter speaks of is anchored in an event in history. Your hope and my hope are based on Jesus' resurrection. That's why Peter calls it a living hope. Since no one can undo history, no one can take away our hope. And I think that's a pretty strong thing. The third insight to capture joy in tough times is that God redeems me for incorruptible glory. Research reports that over a trillion dollars will be handed from this generation to the next generation. Even though that's a lot, it's only money and tangible things. These things that are bought will rust through or wear out or burn or be wasted away or be stolen, neglected, spooled become out of fashion, or simply be cast aside. But this is just how temporary our, our temporary perishable world works. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, it says, God has given us an inheritance that can never perish, spool, or fade, kept in heaven for you. Your inheritance 
in Jesus Christ is his glory. And it is his glory that can never perish, spoil, or fade. The fourth insight to capture joy in tough times is that God refines me for my genuine faith. In the first part of 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, it says, These trials are only to test your faith, to show that it is strong and pure. It is being tested as fire and purifies as gold. And your faith is much more precious to God than gold. Notice what Peter says. When a trial comes, it is an occasion to reflect on how we can trust God more in it and through it. God refines you. Why? So you can make a million dollars? No. So you can become famous and so everyone will admire you? No. God uses your troubles in your life to build faith which God values more than anything. Tough times in life make people bitter or they make people better. Why is it important? What is important in life is not what trials you, but how you decide to face it. Ask yourself, will you become bitter or will you become better? I went through so many trials in my life so far, and I choose not to be bitter. I choose to become a better person and a better Christian. Even today, I face many trials. I am bullied. I have other children talk about me and put me down and spread lies about me every single day. But I choose to not let that irritate me. I choose to let the demons, to, I choose not to let the demons in and not to take an aggressive route. But instead, I usually just leave and walk away from the problem because in the end, it's not going to matter. We don't always follow God's will, but even when God's will is not done, we can respond accordingly. That is why Jesus teaches us to pray. Your, your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven, because God's will often is not done here on earth. God says, even though this is not my original plan for this world, I want to use this trouble now to draw you closer to myself. You can still respond in a way that honors me and that honors my good, pleasing, and perfect will, and I will draw you to myself. In the second part of 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, it states, when, Peter, when Jesus wraps this all up, it's your faith, not your gold, that God will have on display as evidence of his victory. What we all leave behind things when we die, what we will take with us is our relationship that we have with God. And that relationship is founded on faith. And God says, during those tough times when you learn to trust me more, those events that were so difficult to endure, but to which you responded by trusting me deeper, will be put on display. Your instances of faith are going to be showcased. Your faith will be displayed as life's greatest trophy. Think of other believers cheering you on. They applaud you and shout their approval when they see how you responded in hard times. They give glory and thanks to God for their victory in life. And it keeps getting better. There is one more terrific insight to capture joy. The fifth insight to capture joy in tough times is that God replenishes me with an inexpressible joy. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 says, Even now you are happy with a glorious, inexpressible joy. I want you to think about that. It says, even now. This means today, on this date, in this moment in time. I don't know about you, but right now I'm so happy and so taken over by this joy that I get to stand up here and preach my story to you. I was born two months early, at two pounds. The doctor said I wouldn't even live a week, but I'm here today. And me being able to stand here and speak this to you is a miracle, in my opinion. Every morning I wake up and thank the Lord that I do get to wake up another day and spread his name and praise him. And no things don't go, go according, according to my plan, but I do know that they're according to his plan. It was his plan for me to spend most of my childhood in a doctor's office. It was his plan 
because he knew that it would make me stronger and make me the strong person I am today. God wants to remind you that joy is not something that is saved just for heaven. Joy is something that is reserved today for all who have been born again. Every day I find joy and happiness in wearing this necklace that I have on today. Many people at school, many students at school, ask me why I wear this every day, and I answer the same answer every single time, because it symbolizes my love that I have for him. Some do not always like my answer, and that's perfectly fine with me, because their opinion doesn't have to be the same as mine, but I know that my opinion is the right one. I know that without him, I would not be standing here today. Without him, I would not be the person that I am today. I would not be looking at all of you wonderful people, being able to tell my story and pray that it changes you and brings you closer to him in some way. Remember, Peter was writing to those who were persecuted, whose jobs were on the line because they were believers. And some who were even mur martyred, like Paul, and later on, Peter himself. And Peter tells them, even now, you are happy with a glorious, inexpressible joy. Even now. Understand that Peter wasn't writing to spiritual giants. They were mature and immature believers. And God does not expect you to reach spiritual maturity before you can be joyful. All you need is Christ to have inexpressible joy. All you need is Christ in your situation, and you can be happy with a glorious, inexpressible joy. Even now, capture the joy of belonging to your faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Now for the final verse, verse 6. So be truly glad, even though it is necessary for you to endure many trials for a while. You see, God will always be with you. And he will always be by your side when you endure these hard times. But he is always bigger than the tough times that you will endure. Remember, God always honors faith. This coming week will bring hard times. It will bring good times. And it will bring challenges. But I want you to do one thing for me. I want you to choose joy. Because even now, you can be joyful in life. As you can see, the promises that were made the hundreds of years ago are the same promises that we have today. And in closing, let me say this. <clears throat> Our walk in faith is like a marathon race. We start running, and we run, and we're so excited about it. And we run so many miles, and we run up hills, and we run through valleys. We just wonder how we can keep running. And we run, and we run, and we run, and we get tired. And we say, Lord, I can't run any further. I can't do this anymore. But you know, you can't quit on your faith. You can't retire from your faith. And this is what I tell you today. Get involved in the church. Get involved in your community. Get involved in the world. Because this race that we're running, when we finish running this race, we're going to run into the arms of Jesus. And is there any better promise? Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the message and testimony shared by friends this morning. May those who know you come closer to you, and those who have are still and those who have are still seeking your love and peace, and that only you can may find may find you today. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, Jackson brings the uh, hymn of invitation this morning. I promised Bobby, Bobby said, one thing you got to do, make sure you have an invitation. I said, Bobby, of course, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. We're going to have an invitation. The altar is open. If you need to make a commitment, if you need to make some type of recommitment, if you'd like to come up and pray with me, that's fine. Um, but we do want to open the altar to you uh, as we bring this invitation to you. Make that commitment today if you have it. And if you need to make a recommitment, do that as well.